The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Four cases will be submitted this afternoon. Those cases are Virgil Johnson and Virgil Johnson Trucking versus Associated Milk Producers. Second case is Iowa Arboretum Inc. versus Iowa 4-H Foundation. Third case is a State versus uh, Trayvon Washington. And the final case is State versus Cordell uh, Smith. The last two cases are now submitted to the court without argument, and we'll hear the arguments in the Johnson matter. Mr. Berger. Thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court and counsel, my name is Matthew Berger. I'm appearing today on behalf of Associated Milk Producers, Inc., um, which I may refer to as AMPI, as they are commonly known. Uh, this case arises from a uh, contract claim that was commenced by uh, Mr. Johnson. The basic facts in this case are not disputed. Uh, there is a oral contract for an indefinite term that was entered. Uh, both sides agree that because of the indefinite term, it's terminable at will by either party. It is also undisputed that AMPI on three occasions gave notice that it was no longer willing to pay a $100 per load trip fee that it had been paying during the life of the contract and that Mr. Johnson continued to deliver milk uh, knowing that AMPI was not willing to pay that fee. Uh, now the uh, Mr. Johnson argues and the Court of Appeals in this case held that there is a genuine issue of material fact as to whether the uh, actions and those undisputed facts result in a termination of the contract and the formation of a new contract or a modification of the contract that requires consideration. Uh, and uh, respectfully, AMPI submits to the court that that distinction is a false distinction in the context of a contract that is terminable at will. Uh, that an examination of both existing Iowa law, uh, the law of uh, countless other states, and uh, general legal contract principles uh, would provide that a contract that is terminable at will by either party is also modifiable at will by either party. Uh, I want to begin by focusing on what uh, was a crucial distinction in the Court of Appeals decision. Uh, I don't think that there's any serious dispute in this case that in the context of employment contracts that the principle that AMPI relies on is uh, well settled in Iowa. Um, we have the Moody v. Uh, Bogut case and the Willits v. City of Creston case, uh, both Iowa Court of Appeals decisions, and at least the Moody case has been cited with approval by this court, which unambiguously hold that an employment contract that's terminable at will is subject to modification at any time, and that continued performance by an employee constitutes acceptance of that modification. Now, Mr. Johnson and the Court of Appeals uh, attempt to distinguish those cases by saying those are employment cases, they're not ordinary contracts. Uh, that distinction, however, uh, mischaracterizes the nature of an employment contract. Uh, in short, an employment contract is still a contract. Um, and if we look at this court's jurisprudence, going all the way back, when the employment at will doctrine was adopted, it was adopted based on contract principles. Uh, in several employment contract cases, this court has relied on general contract principles in applying employment contracts, determining whether employment contracts are formed, uh, and interpreting them and enforcing them. In fact, when, when our court has drawn a, has noted the difference between an independent contractor and an employee, 
hasn't that doesn't that discussion cut in your favor? And in, in Harvey, I believe we de declined to extend a, a wrongful discharge tort to an independent contractor, noting that the employees who did did have the benefit of that right of action needed greater protection. And here, aren't they arguing the the reverse that the the independent contractor should have more protection? Uh, your Honor, I believe that they essentially are, and the the, the distinction there too is critical that an independent contractor um, has greater ability to negotiate the terms of that contract up front and that was done here um, and it was agreed by both sides that this was going to be an indefinite contract uh, and in fact uh, the, the deposition testimony in this case indicates that that's common in this industry uh, that mill callers uh, come and go between different producers uh, routinely and that that's the norm within this industry. Did you have? To, did your client have to officially say, "Hey, we're terminating our contract relationship" before they could change the terms? Uh, your Honor, uh, no, um, and that gets to the um, false distinction that arises when we look at a terminable at will contract versus other contracts. If this had been a contract like the cases that Mr. Johnson is relying on. Um, cases such as the uh, Davenport Osteopathic Hospital, um, cases such as uh, um, the uh, Clossing v. Hormel case, uh, and uh, other cases, all of those cases involve contract terms that require notification. The Davenport case in particular requires written notification. And so where a contract requires certain time and certain procedural aspects, that's a different situation, and in that case, there would be a required termination to follow the contract. But here we don't have that. And so the actions that AMPI did here in saying, here are the new terms we are willing to continue this relationship under, constitute, in effect, a offer of a new contract that's accepted by performance. So wh why did your client later uh, uh, officially terminate it in writing when all capital letters in bold? Your Honor, uh, we did that after uh, we got uh, Mr. Johnson's summary judgment submissions in this case where it became apparent that he had a very different view of the world and as a belt and suspenders approach, um, AMPI wanted to make it very clear that uh, that was not going to continue uh, in the event that uh, a court were to find adverse to us. Did Mr. Johnson ever say you didn't give him enough advance notice of the change in terms? No, Your Honor. That has never been alleged in this case um, and uh, has never been a claim. And I, I think any objective look at uh, the notice that was given here would uh, indicate that it was sufficient. Um, I want to point this court as well to the uh, Canon v. National Byproducts case. Now, that's an employment case as well, but it applies general contract principles again, and it deals specifically with the situation of um, this uh, distinction between a termination and formation of a new contract and a, a modification, and specifically says that where a contract is terminable at will, uh, in that case, um, we are going to treat it uh, presumptively and even in fact um, my reading of it is a, as a matter of law treat the proposal of a new term as a termination and a formation and that makes sense if we look at the broader picture of why we have the distinction in the form of other contracts I mean that the, the whole distinction between um, termination and formation of a new contract on the one hand and the how does the, how does the course of conduct play into this, you know, and uh, reading the briefs, it seems like all throughout this relationship, the price would go up and down uh, due to gas or other conditions for the delivery charges. So how, uh, you know, how does that course of conduct play? In? I mean, the court held there's a genuine issue of fact. It didn't say they won, but I mean, isn't the jury entitled or the fact finder entitled to, to factor that in, in their decision, whether this was a modification, a termination, if notice is reasonable, things like that? Uh, Your Honor, uh, that would be uh, evidence that a fact finder could consider if um, we didn't have this uh, existing law saying that 
um, in the case of a terminable at will contract um, that it can be modified by either is party. It a, is it a terminal anymore when you keep changing the deal and you keep everybody keeps going along with it without you know, the prices were changed. Every time you change that stuff, you never terminated and said, here's a new contract. Uh, you just kept on going. Uh, they did keep on going, Your Honor, but uh, the legal effect of that course of conduct under the uh, Cannon case and uh, uh, other legal principles would be that the proposal of a new term is essentially creating a new contract that was accepted by continued performance. So the mere fact the parties kept going while making changes uh, doesn't mean that there wasn't a termination necessarily and a formation of a new contract. Uh, it's consistent with our argument here that the legal effect of those proposals for new changes is to create a new contract that's accepted by performance. Am I right that under the uh, UCC uh, you don't need independent consideration for a modification, right? I believe that is true, Your so, Honor. So, I mean, we're talking about a services contract here, but if this was a contract to buy or sell milk, the distinction that the Court of Appeals made wouldn't even matter, right? That is correct. And we've criticized, I think the last time we applied it, we, we noted at least the criticism of the rule that in, in non-goods contracts, modifications need to be supported by independent consideration. Isn't that right? I believe that is correct, Your Honor. I would also note that this court has found that in the case of at-will contracts, um, the continued performance where there is no obligation to continue performance is itself some form of consideration. Um, so I mean, e even that, um, you know, th this court has criticized the need for it, but even in those, this type of contract, this court has in the past worked around it and said under these circumstances, there is, in fact, con continued consideration because AMPI has no obligation to continue hiring Virgil Johnson to continue to haul milk for it. Virgil Johnson has no continuing obligation to haul milk for AMPI, and the fact that they continue that arrangement is itself consideration. Well, the, the dairy farmers aren't obligated to continue selling to your co-op, right? No, they're not. So that's one reason we don't lock in durations in that industry typically, correct? That is correct, Your Honor, that uh, members uh, come and go between different cooperatives uh, with uh, some frequency. Um, milk haulers come and go with some frequency, and sometimes that happens with milk haulers and members moving together, and sometimes it happens separately. Let me ask you a question. I mean... I'm, I'm not sure exactly if the facts are exactly like this, but assume you have kind of a standoff where uh, your client says, I'm not going to pay $100 delivery fee anymore. And uh, the, uh, Mr. Johnson says, well, I'm not going to do it for less than $100. But he continue, he, he does it. Uh, how do we know that he's accepted your offer rather than you've accepted his? Uh, Your Honor, there would be a situation in that where um, if in your hypothetical, AMPI says, I'm not paying the $100 anymore, um, if there was a gap and there was continued performance, that's accepted. Virgil Johnson comes back and says, no, I demand the $100. That's essentially the reverse of this. And AMPI would have the choice of saying, okay, we will pay you more or um, hit the road. Um, we'll find somebody else to do it. Um, so I mean, th this principle can go both ways. So your argument is this is a unilateral contract accepted by his unilateral offer. I mean, they, I know we don't talk about those anymore. No. It, we used to when I was in law school. U unilateral offer accepted by performance, unilateral contract. Correct, Your Honor. That's how the case law has treated um, this type of uh, proposed modification where there's ongoing performance. Um, I would also point the court um, to uh, the uh, law from other states as uh, just being an example of this. Uh, we cite the uh, Pettigrew uh, uh, v. Borden case, which arises under Texas law, which it factually is... Uh, 
virtually indistinguishable, except it involves the dairy products coming out the back end of the plant instead of the milk coming to the front end of the plant. But there the Texas court said, or the Fifth Circuit applying Texas law said that uh, exactly as uh, we are asking this court to hold, that uh, where there's a proposal to modify, um, that's accepted by continued performance. Uh, we cite in our uh, petition for further review a, a case from the uh, federal court for the District of Oregon. And there are countless other states that have all recognized the same contractual principle. Uh, and it makes some common sense when we think about the, the practicalities here. Um, what policy or legal benefit would come from saying, Ampi, if you had terminated and made an offer in writing at the same time, you could accomplish the exact same thing you did by sending a memo saying, here are your terms, um, take them or leave them. Well, there'd be less ambiguity. Uh, it seems to me, um, it, let me present a hypothetical to you. If, if, if the correspondence between you and your hauler had been, um, you know, we've looked at our economics and uh, we just don't think this $100 hauling fee makes any sense anymore. Um, we've reviewed it all and um, please let us know what you think. You know, I mean, if the record had showed correspondence like that, one might think, well, that's a, that's a proposed modification of the contract. Now, I know, I, I know the record does not contain such a letter, but I'm, I'm trying to use it as a springboard to saying, if that was the nature of the communication, there might well be an issue as to whether the letter was a termination of the contract or whether it was an offer to modify, really. Um, the advantage of a termination notice is that there's no ambiguity. We don't, we don't have to fight about it. There it is. We're done. And, Your Honor, I see my time is up. If I may briefly answer uh, your question. Uh, in your hypothetical, I believe that there would be a different issue. But the concern about the ambiguity is addressed when you have an offer for specific terms um, and not just a general statement of dissatisfaction. And that's satisfied here and I believe is consistent with the law of the other cases that we've cited. If, if, if this was a, an offer for a unilateral contract, what was Johnson's continued uh, activity in sending the bill? Uh, Your Honor, that was um, essentially a request for payment to which he was not entitled. Um, the sending of the bill was not part of the performance of the contract, and that's where that is a critical distinction. Well, d does it make the acceptance of the unilateral contract a little murky? Uh, Your Honor, I don't believe it does. Um, where you have uh, clear communications from AMPI that um, we are not willing to pay this, we have Virgil Johnson's testimony that he clearly understood that to be true when he was continuing to deliver. Um, so we don't have that here, Your Honor. Thank, thank you. Thank you as well. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Your Honors. I'm John Anderson, representing the plaintiff appellant resistor, Virgil Johnson and Virgil Johnson Trucking. And if it may please the court, uh, when reviewing an order for granting summary judgment, the appellate court's task is to determine whether it's a general issue of material fact, whether the court correctly applied the law. In this case, neither apply here. Uh, one thing I want to draw your attention to uh, first is where we left off with the conversation about whether or not AMPI uh, knew that it could get another hauler. If you look at the appendix at page 37, there is a letter in December 2013 where AMPI, and this is after uh, AMPI had already reduced the prices, said, uh, and Virgil Johnson had continued to bill at the higher rate, they said, if, if these new terms are not acceptable, please let us know and we'll, f we'll make other arrangements. Well, the response was Virgil Johnson filed the lawsuit. That was a pretty clear uh, answer there. All Here, here's the thing, here's the thing. I Sometimes I kind of wish the law was the way you described it, but I'm not sure it is. Uh, I mean, you get, we get all the time, like the cable company sends you a notice and says, you know, effective next month, your rates are going up $10 a month, right? And I, you know, don't do anything about it, and the bill comes, and I guess I owe that extra $10 a month. I'm not sure would it make any difference 
if I continued to use the service, but I wrote letters to the cable company protesting about the increase? I think I'm still stuck, right? Well, I, I use the service, and in this, you know, it's an acceptance by performance. Well, that may be the case in a unilateral contract, but this is not a unilateral contract. This is a bilateral contract. A unilateral contract, which is an, uh, similar in a, an employment at will situation, you accept an offer by performance. I, I offer to pay somebody X amount of dollars if you show up for work and work. I accept not by returning a promise, but by showing up to work. Why isn't that the case here? I, I mean, they, he wasn't, he, he didn't, he wasn't accepting any specific load of milk until he actually showed up, accepted it, and, and, and delivered it, right? No. I think Virgil Johnson, if he didn't show up Monday morning to pick up milk, he could have been sued for breach of contract. That's significantly different than employment at will. And the, in a bilateral contract, there's an exchange of promises. It's not just, if you do this, I pay you. It's, if you do this, I'll pay you and you accept by promising back. It, it's an exchange of promises, and that's significant it, here. Is our dispute here really over the legal significance of undisputed facts, or is there some fact that a jury would have to decide what happened? Well, we, we have said that the underlying facts are not in dispute, but the ramifications of the actions are in dispute. Are the, was it modified or was it terminated? Here, our argument is it was not terminated. Do, do you agree it was uh, uh, the contract, the contractual relationship was terminable at will upon reasonable notice? Upon reasonable notice, but that's a fact question, I is think. Is 30 days enough as a matter of law if you had 30 days notice? Well, Your Honor, I go... I don't know that it is, and I go back to Davenport. If did, you look did you ever at trial court dispute the um, brevity of the notice? The brevity of the notice was not disputed. What was disputed was whether they could modify the terms of the contract. And I think if you go back and look at Davenport, this is an important case to look at. There was a 90-day written notice provision in there. But if you look at the facts, uh, Blue Cross provided notice to the hospital in August 1963 that it was going to change the terms of compensation July 1st, 19, uh, I'm sorry, back it up. It was 1962 and that it would change the terms January 1st, 1963. They subsequently pushed that off another year. In that case, the hospital had 15 months notice, not 90 days, and that was in, it was irrelevant in that case because it was an executory contract, not like a, not a unilateral contact, contract. And that's an important thing to look at for the court because we argued and the appellate court agreed that the notice provisions in Davenport as well as uh, Apple and Tyndall and Clasing was really a distinction without meaning. I understand that the court in uh, Shelby County Cookers called into question the uh, what we called was the holding in uh, Hess that a contract for an indefinite term uh, can be terminated on reasonable notice. However, there was a couple of cases cited on page 17 of the uh, defendant's brief uh, that refer to distributor cases, Des Moines, uh, Blue Ribbon, and C.C. Hoff. And in these distributor cases, they're analogous somewhat to a, uh, a milk hauler case because in these cases the milk hauler brings more to the table than just his services. Virgil Johnson isn't just showing up and hauling milk. Virgil Johnson has invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in trucks and equipment, milk tanks. He buys he buys these over and over again. He's got employees. He pays him his employees well, and he play, pays them benefits. He hauls for one but person. But on your I, and I understand all that, but. Isn't it true that the arrangement was they, they could stop using him at any time? It is. A AMPI? I mean. Well, so on reasonable notice, the problem is they did not terminate it. Going back to Davenport, if you would terminate it according to the provisions of the agreement, and in this case it would be reasonable notice, you can do that. But in, in Davenport, they didn't, exit, they, they didn't invoke the 90-day termination provision. They just, one side said, we're going to start paying a, a different rate. Yes, okay. but I, I don't think that there's really a distinction there because in this case, they didn't say they were terminating it either. They just said, 
we're paying a different rate. And I think you go back to uh, the, the, the hypothetical that was presented before, and it gets into an unmanageable, unpredictable situation that does not provide clarity, where one side says, I'm changing the terms, the other side says, I don't accept it, but performs the other, and says, I'm charging at this rate. The other side accepts their services and says, but we're paying at this rate. Who, it just doesn't provide clarity. What provides clarity is terminate the contract. You have the option to do that. So in, in, in every other case like this going forward, are we gonna require, if an employer wants to impose different job con conditions, are they gonna have to say, by the way, you're fired, but I'll hire you back, and here's the new, new, here are your new hours? No, I'm not arguing that because that's an employment at will case that has different that's a, a different type of contract. Does contract law apply? Yes, to certain cases, yes, not to this case. That's an employment at will. You can hire, fire, on, uh, and change the terms on no notice. If you show up for work, you accept that. Not with, a, not with an independent contractor, it's a different type of relationship. I mean, I just can't see a distinction between employment at will and independent contractor at will that's gonna be more favorable to the independent contractor, well, which is what you're arguing for. Well, if you're an employee, you do lose out in certain things, but you also gain certain protections. And this is, I mean, looking at the broader context, we're just seeing this with Uber cases today. If you're, if, if you're gonna uh, be an independent contractor, you get to control your rates, you get to control your certain parts and control. If you're an employee though, and you can be fired, and the terms can be changed at will, there's certain benefits that then, go with right. that. So you're in, in your example, if Uber says, well, we're gonna change the commissions that we're paying our drivers, uh, you know, and I assume they have thousands and thousands of them around the country, and they're going to reduce the commissions 10%. They have to term it, send notices of termination to all of those drivers? It, they're independent. If they want them to be independent contractors, yes. If they don't, they need them as employees. And they have to, they have to also then pay back wages, uh, you know, all the things that go along with that. There's a distinction in our law between independent contractors, and there's benefits, there's pros and cons to being in either situation. And if, if, if AMPI wanted that level of control over Virgil Johnson and the haulers, they could have hired him. In 2000, if you look at the deposition of Vir, uh, Virgil Johnson, Virgil Johnson uh, had the loyalty of many farm producers. And they were with uh, Beatrice Cheese or another, uh, another uh, uh, um, processor. And they were looking for a new home. And they looked at Virgil Johnson. AMPI approached Virgil Johnson and said, Virgil Johnson, you've got, you've got uh, very loyal customers. Why don't you bring them over to AMPI? And Virgil Johnson talked to him about it. And he was looking out for his, his producer's best interest as well as his own. And he talked about uh, forming a written contract. AMPI said, the way we do it is with a handshake. Virgil Johnson, he brought, he's, he's bought milk routes. He's bought trucks. He's bought he uh, pays employees. He's brought producers to AMPI. Now the contract between the is between the producers and and the processor, but Virgil Johnson brought those producers to AMPI's table. Now, and again, there are distinctions between employment at will and a contract for in for an indefinite time. Shelby County Cookers, you can look at that one, but that's. The question in there is termination of a contract, not modification. The only modification cases that have been cited and discussed are all employment at will. All this goes back to Davenport and Apple v. Tyndall. If you have an executory contract and a bilateral contract, and in this case, it is a bilateral contract as acceptance is shown by an exchange of promises, and in its executory, until it is terminated, there are ongoing obligations. Let me try this hypothetical. Um, I hire a, a, a neighbor to mow my lawn, tell him I'll pay him 50 bucks each time he, he mows it. And then the next year I realize there are a number of kids out there want to do it for less and I say, I'm gonna pay you 45 to mow my lawn going forward. He says, I want 50. I say, I'm only gonna pay you 45 and I come home from work, he's mowed my lawn. How much do I owe him? <laughs> He I only owe him the 45 I offered to pay, right? Did you continue to accept him from mowing the lawn? If it only happened one time, I would say 
well, you only what, pay him what I you want. Say, but here, here's but, the 45 I agreed to pay you, and that's all I'm going to pay you. And then he keeps coming well, back and mowing it, and I keep paying him 45, and then he sends me bills for the extra five. You should have told him, keep off my lawn. <laughs> that's what I would say. You well, have the option to terminate it. But, but he had the option not to mow. He did, but you continued to accept his services, and that's what AMPI did. But the rule you see, it seems like it's going to force force more terminations, including artificial ones, if you have to have, if you need the formality of you are fired, that, and here's the new offer. That prov that provides that provides clarity, and for an independent, is, it, is there anything unclear about? I'll pay you forty five bucks to mow my lawn. He comes and mows it, and I give him 45 bucks, and he keeps coming back, and I say, I'm not gonna pay anything more than that. In, in this case, there was, a, there was an agreement in place. AMPI took on the risk of trying to change those terms without getting the acceptance of Virgil Johnson. To form a new contract, there's gotta be a meeting of the minds, especially in a bilateral contract. We don't have that here. If you- well, I, I guess I wanna go back to Justice Wiggins' comments about a course of dealing here. It sounds like this has been a long-term relationship. The rates of reimbursement have gone up and down repeatedly, and always without a termination, I assume. I, wouldn't you agree that this has gone on, it goes up, it goes down, there's different market fluctuations and different reimbursements for him, and they just all continue to, to move along, and it's never been an issue until this time he just decides, well, no, I like it at the 100, and I'm... I'm just assuming that that's the contract that we're going to be relying upon. It, this does not prevent parties from modifying a contract and agreeing to different terms. That, that's different. They can do that. That's not what happened here. Virgil Johnson that, did not that's agree. That's what they have been doing. Uh, it, it sounds like for the last 15 years or 14 years, however many years they've been in business together, they've been doing that for 14 years on that exact basis until now. But that was, uh, that was not the trip fee that we're talking about, and there was a cent in meeting of the minds, which that's clear, you can modify a contract. Here we did not have a cent, we had repeated protests, continued to bill at the higher rate, they continued to accept his services, they could have terminated it, according to Davenport. Well, it's not unreasonable for them to continue to do that if they've, we've been doing that now for 15 or 20 years. We have always said, well, this is now gonna be the the drop rate that we're gonna pay. Uh, it's not gonna be $100, it, it fluctuates, it sounds like, over the number of years. So why is the burden I any more on, the, on AMPI than it would be on, on Mr. Johnson? The, the issue here is the $100 rate for specifically, which was on top of the other compensation. That has never changed. And that, again, he did not agree to. The other things, you can modify, nobody's saying you can't modify a contract. You can, but there has to be consent, or as else assent by, by certain actions. Here it's clear, Virgil Johnson did not consent or assent. He did just as the hospital did in Davenport. Davenport provides clarity. If you, if you change the terms of the contract without the other side's consent, you bear the risk of being liable for breach of contract. If you don't like the terms, look to how you can terminate the contract. AMPI knew that it could do that. Maybe AMPI was worried that if it terminated the contract, it would lose Virgil Johnson's loyal, loyal uh, producers. I mean, the, and, and AMPI knows how to con uh, terminate a contract. They did it in December 2014. You're right on there, this contract is terminated. That's how you con terminate a contract. Otherwise, how is the small businessman to know? I, we've, we've reached an agreement I think I can stand by that agreement. I set my own terms. If you don't like them, don't engage my services. I'm a businessman. These are my terms. If you don't like it, don't use me. Find somebody else. They could have done that. For whatever reason, they decided not to, and they, they should bear the risk of that. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Mr. Berger, you may present your rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, counsel ended with a uh, question at the end, how is a small businessman to know? There is no dispute in this case that Virgil Johnson knew that Ampey was not well, willing to pay. Well, wait a second pay. here. You know, Justice Mansfield asked a question earlier about 
how do we know that he accepted the hundred dollar decline or you didn't maintain the hundred dollar increase and if I you look at these bills in this appendix you know the September bill you write back saying pursuant to the letter we're not paying the hundred dollars but you keep taking money in October you keep taking deliveries in October where he bills you you keep taking deliveries in November where he bills you and you keep taking deliveries in December where he bills you now I, I could see you know maybe October you've had enough and said you know we told you in September we're not paying it so we're done but you waited all the way to December in order to do this twenty two thousand dollars to the bad why why can't isn't there a genuine issue genuine issue of material fact as to whether or not after you decrease the price you accepted the higher price by continuing to have it serviced knowing that he was billing you and I'm not saying you're, you're gonna lose or win but isn't that a fact for someone to have to figure out? Uh, Your Honor, in the context of this case and the evidence in the record, uh, no, it's not. Uh, the communication on July 31st was crystal clear. The communication uh, with the handwritten note on the invoice was clear. The communication in December was clear. And most importantly, Virgil Johnson testified that he understood that Ampey was not willing to pay that amount. Um, so his own testimony demonstrates that there's no issue of fact on that point in this case. Um, I want to touch. Um, is the fundamental question whether the first contract was terminated? Is that what we have to decide? Um, that is not what this court has to decide in, a con in this context. And that's because the case law indicates that, that we've cited that where a contract is terminable at will, um, this court does not recognize a distinction between a termination and reform reformation and a modification. And that's the Cannon v. National Byproducts case, where this court said, uh, we find it particularly inappropriate to require independent consideration. And in these situations, it is a preferable approach to view the issue as an entirely new contract. Um, so that's the law of this court in Cannon. Uh, it is an employment case, but that whole discussion is discussing general contract principles. Uh, this is also the principle that is recognized in uh, the other states in, in the cases that we've cited, that in the context of an at-will contract, um, that distinction is irrelevant. Is this a bilateral contract or a unilateral one in your view? Uh, Your Honor, I believe that that will contract is um, essentially a unilateral contract. Um, so is it your position that each delivery, in effect, was a separate deal? You didn't have to, until he actually showed up with milk, you didn't have an obligation to, to use him, right? Uh, I would say when he showed up at the member's farm to pick up yeah, the milk. to pick up, right. Once he uh, started performance, that's yes. right. That's in contract law, right. Okay. Um, but I think that that is a critical distinction and is part of the definition of what an at-will contract is. Um, if Mr. Johnson had wanted stronger protections, he could have required, as they did in Davenport, um, written notice with so many days prior to termination. We don't have that. We have an at-will contract. Uh, with that, Your Honor, unless there's uh, further questions, uh, we respectfully ask that the decision of the uh, Court of Appeals re be reversed and that the summary judgment entered by the District Court be reaffirmed. Thank you. Thank you as well. The case then is submitted, and we'll now hear the arguments in Iowa Arboretum.